This is a text-to-speech narration of Leon Trotsky's text, The Lessons of October. Any pronunciation errors are due to the limitations of this technology. Chapter 7. The October Insurrection and Soviet Legality In September, while the Democratic Conference was in session, Lenin demanded that we immediately proceed with the insurrection. In order to treat insurrection in a Marxist way, i.e. as an art, we must at the same time, without losing a single moment, organize a headquarters of the insurgent detachments, distribute our forces, move the reliable regiments to the most important points, surround the Alexandrinsky Theater, occupy the Peter and Paul Fortress, arrest the general staff and the government, and move against the officer cadets and the savage division, those detachments which would rather die than allow the enemy to approach the strategic points of the city. We must mobilize the armed workers and call them to fight the last desperate fight, occupy the telegraph and telephone exchange at once, move our insurrection headquarters to the central telephone exchange and connect it by telephone with all the factories, all the regiments, all the points of armed fighting, etc. Of course, this is all by way of example, only to illustrate the fact that at the present moment, it is impossible to remain loyal to Marxism, to remain loyal to the revolution, unless insurrection is treated as an art. C.W. Vol. 26, Marxism and Insurrection, September 13, 14, 1917, p. 187. The above formulation of the question presupposed that the preparation and completion of the insurrection were to be carried out through party channels and in the name of the party, and afterwards the seal of approval was to be placed on the victory by the Congress of Soviets. The Central Committee did not adopt this proposal. The insurrection was led into Soviet channels and was linked in our agitation with the Second Soviet Congress. A detailed explanation of this difference of opinion will make it clear that this question pertains not to principle, but rather to a technical issue of great practical importance. We have already pointed out with what intense anxiety Lenin regarded the postponement of the insurrection. In view of the vacillation among the party leaders, an agitation formally linking the impending insurrection with the impending Soviet Congress seemed to him an impermissible delay, a concession to the irresolute a loss of time through vacillation, and an outright crime. Lenin kept reiterating this idea from the end of September onward. There is a tendency, or an opinion, in our central committee and among the leaders of our party, he wrote on September 29, which favors waiting for the Congress of Soviets, and is opposed to taking power immediately, is opposed to an immediate insurrection. That tendency or opinion must be overcome. C.W. Vol. 26 the crisis has matured September 29, 1917, p. 82. At the beginning of October, Lenin wrote, Delay is criminal. To wait for the Congress of Soviets would be a childish game of formalities, a disgraceful game of formalities, and a betrayal of the revolution. C.W. Vol. 26, Letter to the Central Committee, the Moscow and Petrograd Committees, and the Bolshevik members of the Petrograd and Moscow Soviets October 1, 1917, p. 141. In his Theses for the Petrograd Conference of October 8, Lenin said, It is necessary to fight against constitutional illusions and hopes placed in the Congress of Soviets, to discard the preconceived idea that we absolutely must wait for it. C.W. Vol. 26, Theses for a report at the October 8 Conference of the Petrograd Organization, also for a resolution and instructions to those elected to the Party Congress September 29, October 4, 1917, p. 144. Finally, on October 24, Lenin wrote, It is now absolutely clear that to delay the uprising would be fatal. History will not forgive revolutionaries for procrastinating when they could be victorious today, and they certainly will be victorious today. While they risk losing much tomorrow, in fact, they risk losing everything. C.W. Vol. 26, Letter to Central Committee Members, October 24, 1917, pp. 2-34-35. All these letters, every sentence of which was forged on the anvil of revolution, are of exceptional value in that they serve both to characterize Lenin and to provide an estimate of the situation at the time. The basic and all-pervasive thought expressed in them is anger, protest, and indignation against a fatalistic, temporizing, social-democratic, Menshevik attitude to revolution, as if the latter were an endless film. 
If time is, generally speaking, a prime factor in politics, then the importance of time increases a hundredfold in war and in revolution. It is not at all possible to accomplish on the morrow everything that can be done today. To rise in arms, to overwhelm the enemy, to seize power, may be possible today, but tomorrow may be impossible. But to seize power is to change the course of history. Is it really true that such a historic event can hinge upon an interval of 24 hours? Yes, it can. When things have reached the point of armed insurrection, events are to be measured not by the long yardstick of politics, but by the short yardstick of war. To lose several weeks, several days, and sometimes even a single day, is tantamount under certain conditions to the surrender of the revolution, to capitulation. Had Lenin not sounded the alarm, had there not been all this pressure and criticism on his part, had it not been for his intense and passionate revolutionary mistrust, the party would probably have failed to align its front at the decisive moment. For the opposition among the party leaders was very strong, and the staff plays a major role in all wars, including civil wars. At the same time, however, it is quite clear that to prepare the insurrection, and to carry it out under cover of preparing for the Second Soviet Congress and under the slogan of defending it, was of inestimable advantage to us. From the moment when we, as the Petrograd Soviet, invalidated Kerensky's order transferring two-thirds of the garrison to the front, we had actually entered a state of armed insurrection. Lenin, who was not in Petrograd, could not appraise the full significance of this fact. So far as I remember, there is not a mention of it in all his letters during this period. Yet the outcome of the insurrection of October 25 was at least three quarters settled, if not more, the moment that we opposed the transfer of the Petrograd garrison, created the Revolutionary Military Committee October 16 appointed our own commissars in all army divisions and institutions, and thereby completely isolated not only the general staff of the Petrograd zone, but also the government. As a matter of fact, we had here an armed insurrection, an armed though bloodless insurrection of the Petrograd regiments against the provisional government under the leadership of the Revolutionary Military Committee and under the slogan of preparing the defense of the Second Soviet Congress which would decide the ultimate fate of the state power. Lenin's counsel to begin the insurrection in Moscow, where, on his assumptions, we could gain a bloodless victory, flowed precisely from the fact that in his underground refuge he had no opportunity to assess the radical turn that took place not only in mood, but also in organizational ties among the military rank and file as well as the army hierarchy after the peaceful insurrection of the garrison of the capital in the middle of October. The moment that the regiments, upon the instructions of the Revolutionary Military Committee, refused to depart from the city, we had a victorious insurrection in the capital, only slightly screened at the top by the remnants of the bourgeois democratic state forms. The insurrection of October 25 was only supplementary in character. This is precisely why it was painless. In Moscow, on the other hand, the struggle was much longer and bloodier, despite the fact that in Petrograd the power of the Council of People's Commissars had already been established. It is plain enough that had the insurrection begun in Moscow, prior to the overturn in Petrograd, it would have dragged on even longer, with the outcome very much in doubt. Failure in Moscow would have had grave effects on Petrograd. Of course, a victory along these lines was not at all excluded. But the way that events actually occurred proved much more economical, much more favorable, and much more successful. We were more or less able to synchronize the seizure of power with the opening of the Second Soviet Congress only because the peaceful, almost legal, armed insurrection at least in Petrograd was already three-quarters, if not nine-tenths achieved. Our reference to this insurrection as legal is in the sense that it was an outgrowth of the normal conditions of dual power. Even when the conciliationists dominated the Petrograd Soviet, it frequently happened that the Soviet revised or amended the decisions of the government. This was, so to speak, part of the constitution under the regime that has been inscribed in the annals of history as the Kerensky period. When we Bolsheviks assumed power in the Petrograd Soviet, we only continued and deepened the methods of dual power. We took it upon ourselves to revise the order transferring the troops to the front. 
By this very act we covered up the actual insurrection of the Petrograd garrison with the traditions and methods of legal dual power. Nor was that all. While formally adapting our agitation on the question of power to the opening of the Second Soviet Congress, we developed and deepened the already existing traditions of dual power and prepared the framework of Soviet legality for the Bolshevik insurrection on an all-Russian scale. We did not lull the masses with any Soviet constitutional illusions, for under the slogan of a struggle for the Second Soviet Congress, we won over to our side the bayonets of the Revolutionary Army and consolidated our gains organizationally. And in addition, we succeeded, far more than we expected, in luring our enemies, the conciliationists, into the trap of Soviet legality. Resorting to trickery in politics, all the more so in revolution, is always dangerous. You will most likely fail to dupe the enemy, but the masses who follow you may be duped instead. Our trickery proved 100% successful, not because it was an artful scheme devised by wily strategists seeking to avoid a civil war, but because it derived naturally from the disintegration of the conciliationist regime with its glaring contradictions. The provisional government wanted to get rid of the garrison. The soldiers did not want to go to the front. We invested this natural unwillingness with a political expression. We gave it a revolutionary goal and a legal cover. Thereby we secured unprecedented unanimity within the garrison and bound it up closely with the Petrograd workers. Our opponents, on the contrary, because of their hopeless position and their muddle-headedness, were inclined to accept the Soviet cover at its face value. They yearned to be deceived, and we provided them with ample opportunity to gratify their desire. Between the conciliationists and ourselves, there was a struggle for Soviet legality. In the minds of the masses, the Soviets were the source of all power. Out of the Soviets came Kerensky, Tseretelli, and Skoblev. But we ourselves were closely bound up with the Soviets through our basic slogan, All Power to the Soviets. The bourgeoisie derived their succession to power from the State Duma. The conciliationists derived their succession from the Soviets, and so did we. But the conciliationists sought to reduce the Soviets to nothing. While we were striving to transfer power to the Soviets, the conciliationists could not break as yet with the Soviet heritage and were in haste to create a bridge from the latter to parliamentarism. With this in mind, they convened the Democratic Conference and created the pre-parliament. The participation of the Soviets in the pre-parliament gave a semblance of sanction to this procedure. The conciliationists sought to catch the revolution with a bait of Soviet legality, and after hooking it, to drag it into the channel of bourgeois parliamentarism. But we were also interested in making use of Soviet legality. At the conclusion of the Democratic Conference, we extracted from the conciliationists a promise to convene the Second Soviet Congress. This Congress placed them in an extremely embarrassing position. On the one hand, they could not oppose convening it without breaking with Soviet legality. On the other hand, they could not help seeing that the Congress because of its composition boded them little good. In consequence, all the more insistently did we appeal to the Second Congress as the real master of the country, and all the more did we adapt our entire preparatory work to the support and defense of the Congress of Soviets against the inevitable attacks of the counter-revolution. If the conciliationists attempted to hook us with Soviet legality through the pre-parliament emanating from the Soviets, then we, on our part, lured them with the same Soviet legality through the Second Congress. It is one thing to prepare an armed insurrection under the naked slogan of the seizure of power by the party, and quite another thing to prepare and then carry out an insurrection under the slogan of defending the rights of the Congress of Soviets. Thus, the adaptation of the question of the seizure of power to the Second Soviet Congress did not involve any naive hopes that the Congress itself could settle the question of power. Such fetishism of the Soviet form was entirely alien to us. All the necessary work for the conquest of power, not only the political but also the organizational and military technical work for the seizure of power, went on at full speed. But the legal cover for all this work was always provided by an invariable reference to the coming Congress, which would settle the question of power. Waging an offensive all along the line, we kept up the appearance of being on the defensive. 
On the other hand, the provisional government, if it had been able to make up its mind to defend itself seriously, would have had to attack the Congress of Soviets, prohibit its convocation, and thereby provide the opposing side with a motive most damaging to the government for an armed insurrection. Moreover, we not only place the provisional government in an unfavorable political position, we also lulled their already sufficiently lazy and unwieldy minds. These people seriously believed that we were only concerned with Soviet parliamentarism and with a new Congress which would adopt a new resolution on power in the style of the resolutions adopted by the Petrograd and Moscow Soviets and that the government would then ignore it, using the pre-parliament and the coming constituent assembly as a pretext and thus put us in a ridiculous position. We have the irrefutable testimony of Kerensky to the effect that the minds of the sagest middle-class wiseacres were bent precisely in this direction. In his memoirs, Kerensky relates how, in his study, at midnight on October 25, stormy disputes raged between himself, Dan, and the others over the armed insurrection, which was then in full swing. Kerensky says, Dan declared, first of all, that they were better informed than I was and that I was exaggerating the events, under the influence, of reports from my reactionary staff. He then informed me that the resolution adopted by the majority of the Soviets of the Republic, which had so offended the self-esteem of the government, was of extreme value and essential for bringing about the shift in the mood of the masses, that its effect was already making itself felt, and that now the influence of Bolshevik propaganda would decline rapidly. On the other hand, according to Dan's own words, the Bolsheviks themselves had declared, in negotiations with the leaders of the Soviet majority, their readiness to submit to the will of the Soviet majority, and that they were ready tomorrow to use all measures to quell the insurrection which flared up against their own wishes and without their sanction. In conclusion, after mentioning that the Bolsheviks would disband their military staff tomorrow, always tomorrow, Dan declared that all the measures I had taken to crush the insurrection had only irritated the masses, and that by my meddling I was generally hindering the representatives of the Soviet majority from successfully concluding their negotiations with the Bolsheviks for the liquidation of the insurrection. To complete the picture, I ought to add that at the very moment Dan was imparting to me this remarkable information, the armed detachments of Red Guards were occupying government buildings, one after another, and almost immediately after the departure of Dan and his comrades from the Winter Palace, Minister Kardashev, on his way home from a session of the provisional government, was arrested on Millionee Street and taken directly to Smolny, whither Dan was returning to resume his peaceful conversations with the Bolsheviks. I must confess that the Bolsheviks deported themselves at that time with great energy and no less skill. At the moment when the insurrection was in full blast, and while the Red Troops were operating all over the city, several Bolshevik leaders especially designated for the purpose sought, not unsuccessfully, to make the representatives of revolutionary democracy see but remain blind, hear but remain deaf. All night long these wily men engaged in endless squabbles over various formulas which were supposed to serve as the basis for reconciliation and for the liquidation of the insurrection. By this method of negotiating, the Bolsheviks gained a great deal of time. But the fighting forces of the SRS and the Mensheviks were not mobilized in time. But of course, this is Ked, A. Kerensky, From Afar, pages 197-98. Well put, Ked. The conciliationists, as we gather from the above account, were completely hooked with the bait of Soviet legality. Kerensky's assumption that certain Bolsheviks were specially disguised in order to deceive the Mensheviks and the SRS about the pending liquidation of the insurrection is in fact not true. As a matter of fact, the Bolsheviks most actively participating in the negotiations were those who really desired the liquidation of the insurrection and who believed in the formula of a socialist government formed by the conciliation of all parties. Objectively, however, these parliamentarians doubtless proved of some service to the insurrection feeding, with their own illusions, the illusions of the enemy. But they were able to render this service to the revolution only because the party, in spite of all their counsels and all their warnings, pressed on with the insurrection with unabating energy and carried it through to the end.
a combination of altogether exceptional circumstances great and small, was needed to ensure the success of this extensive and enveloping maneuver. Above all, an army was needed which was unwilling to fight any longer. The entire course of the revolution, particularly during the initial stages from February to October, inclusive, would have been, as we have already said, altogether different if at the moment of revolution there had not existed in the country a broken and discontented peasant army of many millions. These conditions alone made it possible to bring to a successful conclusion the experiment with the Petrograd garrison, which predetermined the victorious outcome of October. There cannot be the slightest talk of sanctifying into any sort of a law this peculiar combination of a dry and almost imperceptible insurrection together with the defense of Soviet legality against Kornilov and his followers. On the contrary, we can state with certainty that this experience will never be repeated anywhere in such a form. But a careful study of it is most necessary. It will tend to broaden the horizon of every revolutionist, disclosing before him the multiplicity and variety of ways and means which can be set in motion, provided the goal is kept clearly in mind, the situation is correctly appraised, and there is a determination to carry the struggle through to the end. In Moscow, the insurrection took much longer and entailed much greater sacrifices. The explanation for this lies partly in the fact that the Moscow garrison was not subjected to the same revolutionary preparation as the Petrograd garrison in connection with the transfer of regiments to the front we have already said, and we repeat that the armed insurrection in Petrograd was carried out in two installments. The first in the early part of October, when the Petrograd regiments, obeying the decision of the Soviet, which harmonized completely with their own desires, refused to carry out the orders from headquarters and did so with impunity, and the second on October 25, when only a minor and supplementary insurrection was required in order to sever the umbilical cord of the February state power. But in Moscow, the insurrection took place in a single stage, and that was probably the main reason that it was so protracted. But there was also another reason. The leadership was not decisive enough. In Moscow, we saw a swing from military action to negotiations only to be followed by another swing from negotiations to military action. If vacillations on the part of the leaders, which are transmitted to the followers, are generally harmful in politics, then they become a mortal danger under the conditions of an armed insurrection. The ruling class has already lost confidence in its own strength, otherwise there could, in general, be no hope for victory but the apparatus still remains in its hands. The task of the revolutionary class is to conquer the state apparatus. To do so, it must have confidence in its own forces. Once the party has led the workers to insurrection, it has to draw from this all the necessary conclusions. A la guerra come a la guerra, war is war. Under war conditions, vacillation and procrastination are less permissible than at any other time. The measuring stick of war is a short one. To mark time, even for a few hours, is to restore a measure of confidence to the ruling class while taking it away from the insurgents. But this is precisely what determines the relationship of forces, which in turn determines the outcome of the insurrection. From this point of view, it is necessary to study, step by step, the course of military operations in Moscow in their connection with the political leadership. It would be of great significance to indicate several other instances where the civil war took place under special conditions, being complicated, for instance, by the intrusion of a national element. Such a study, based upon carefully digested factual data, would greatly enrich our knowledge of the mechanics of civil war and thereby facilitate the elaboration of certain methods, rules, and devices of a sufficiently general character to serve as a sort of manual of civil war. But in anticipation of the partial conclusions of such a study, it may be said that the course of the civil war in the provinces was largely determined by the outcome in Petrograd, even despite the delay in Moscow. The February Revolution cracked the old apparatus. The provisional government inherited it and was unable either to renew it or to strengthen it. In consequence, its state apparatus functioned between February and October only as a relic of bureaucratic inertia. The provincial bureaucracy had become accustomed to do what Petrograd did. It did this in February and repeated it in October. 
It was an enormous advantage to us that we were preparing to overthrow a regime which had not yet had time to consolidate itself. The extreme instability and want of assurance of the February state apparatus facilitated our work in the extreme by instilling the revolutionary masses and the party itself with self-assurance. A similar situation existed in Germany and Austria after November 9, 1918. There, however, the social democracy filled in the cracks of the state apparatus and helped to establish a bourgeois republican regime. And though this regime cannot be considered a pattern of stability, it has nevertheless already survived six years. So far as other capitalist countries are concerned, they will not have this advantage, i.e. the proximity of a bourgeois and a proletarian revolution. Their February is already long past. To be sure, in England, there are a good many relics of feudalism, but there are absolutely no grounds for speaking of an independent bourgeois revolution in England. Purging the country of the monarchy and the lords and the rest will be achieved by the first sweep of the broom of the English proletariat when they come into power. The proletarian revolution in the West will have to deal with a completely established bourgeois state. But this does not mean that it will have to deal with a stable state apparatus for the very possibility of proletarian insurrection implies an extremely advanced process of the disintegration of the capitalist state. If in our country the October Revolution unfolded in the struggle with a state apparatus which did not succeed in stabilizing itself after February, then in other countries the insurrection will be confronted with a state apparatus in a state of progressive disintegration. It may be assumed as a general rule we pointed this out as far back as the Fourth World Congress of the Comintern one that the force of the pre-October resistance of the bourgeoisie in old capitalist countries will generally be much greater than in our country. It will be more difficult for the proletariat to gain victory. But on the other hand, the conquest of power will immediately secure for them a much more stable and firm position than we attained on the day after October. In our country, the civil war took on real scope only after the proletariat had conquered power in the chief cities and industrial centers, and it lasted for the first three years of Soviet rule. There is every indication that in the countries of Central and Western Europe, it will be much more difficult for the proletariat to conquer power, but that after the seizure of power they will have a much freer hand. Naturally, these considerations concerning prospects are only hypothetical. A good deal will depend on the order in which revolutions take place in the different countries of Europe, the possibilities of military intervention, the economic and military strength of the Soviet Union at the time, and so on. But in any case, our basic, and we believe incontestable postulate, that the actual process of the conquest of power will encounter in Europe and America a much more serious, obstinate, and prepared resistance from the ruling classes than was the case with us makes it all the more incumbent upon us to view the armed insurrection in particular and civil war in general as an art. Chapter 8, again, on the Soviets and the party in a proletarian revolution. In our country, both in 1905 and in 1917, the Soviets of workers' deputies grew out of the movement itself as its natural organizational form at a certain stage of the struggle. But the young European parties, who have more or less accepted Soviets as a doctrine and principle, always run the danger of treating Soviets as a fetish, as some self-sufficing factor in a revolution. Yet, in spite of the enormous advantages of Soviets as the organs of struggle for power, there may well be cases where the insurrection may unfold on the basis of other forms of organization factory committees, trade unions, etc., and Soviets may spring up only during the insurrection itself, or even after it has achieved victory, as organs of state power. Most highly instructive from this standpoint is the struggle which Lenin launched after the July days against the fetishism of the organizational form of Soviets. In proportion as the SRS and Menshevik Soviets became, in July, organizations openly driving the soldiers into an offensive and crushing the Bolsheviks, to that extent the revolutionary movement of the proletarian masses was obliged and compelled to seek new paths and channels. Lenin indicated the factory committees as the organizations of the struggle for power. See, for instance, the reminiscences of Comrade Orgenikids.
and is very likely that the movement would have proceeded on those lines if it had not been for the Kornilov uprising, which forced the conciliationist Soviets to defend themselves and made it possible for the Bolsheviks to imbue them with a new revolutionary vigor, binding them closely to the masses through the left, i.e. Bolshevik wing. This question is of enormous international importance, as was shown by the recent German experience. It was in Germany that Soviets were several times created as organs of insurrection without an insurrection taking place, and as organs of state power without any power. This led to the following. In 1923, the movement of broad proletarian and semi-proletarian masses began to crystallize around the factory committees, which in the main fulfilled all the functions assumed by our own Soviets in the period preceding the direct struggle for power. Yet, during August and September 1923, several comrades advanced the proposal that we should proceed to the immediate creation of Soviets in Germany. After a long and heated discussion, this proposal was rejected, and rightly so. In view of the fact that the factory committees had already become in action, the rallying centers of the revolutionary masses, Soviets would only have been a parallel form of organization, without any real content, during the preparatory stage. They could have only distracted attention from the material targets of the insurrection army, police, armed bands, railways, etc., by fixing it on a self-contained organizational form. And on the other hand, the creation of Soviets as such, prior to the insurrection and apart from the immediate tasks of the insurrection, would have meant an open proclamation, we mean to attack you. The government, compelled to tolerate the factory committees insofar as the latter had become the rallying centers of great masses, would have struck at the very first Soviet as an official organ of an attempt to seize power. The communists would have had to come out in defense of the Soviets as purely organizational entities. The decisive struggle would have broken out not in order to seize or defend any material positions, nor at a moment chosen by us a moment when the insurrection would flow from the conditions of the mass movement. No, the struggle would have flared up over the Soviet banner, at a moment chosen by the enemy and forced upon us. In the meantime, it is quite clear that the entire preparatory work for the insurrection could have been carried out successfully under the authority of the factory and shop committees, which were already established as mass organizations, and which were constantly growing in numbers and strength and that this would have allowed the party to maneuver freely with regard to fixing the date for the insurrection. Soviets, of course, would have had to arise at a certain stage. It is doubtful whether, under the above-mentioned conditions, they would have arisen as the direct organs of insurrection, in the very fire of the conflict, because of the risk of creating two revolutionary centers at the most critical moment. An English proverb says that you must not swap horses while crossing a stream. It is possible that Soviets would have been formed after the victory at all the decisive places in the country. In any case, a triumphant insurrection would inevitably have led to the creation of Soviets as organs of state power. It must not be forgotten that in our country, the Soviets grew up in the democratic stage of the revolution, becoming legalized, as it were, at that stage, and subsequently being inherited and utilized by us. This will not be repeated in the proletarian revolutions of the West. There, in most cases, the Soviets will be created in response to the call of the communists, and they will consequently be created as the direct organs of proletarian insurrection. To be sure, it is not at all excluded that the disintegration of the bourgeois state apparatus will have become quite acute before the proletariat is able to seize power. This would create the conditions for the formation of Soviets as the open organs of preparing the insurrection. But this is not likely to be the general rule. Most likely, it will be possible to create Soviets only in the very last days, as the direct organs of the insurgent masses. Finally, it is quite probable that such circumstances will arise, as will make the Soviets emerge, either after the insurrection has passed its critical stage, or even in its closing stages as organs of the new state power. All these variants must be kept in mind so as to safeguard us from falling into organizational fetishism, and so as not to transform the Soviets from what they ought to be flexible and living form of struggle into an organizational principle imposed upon the movement from the outside, disrupting its normal development. There has been some talk lately in our press to the effect that we are not, mind you, 
in a position to tell through what channels the proletarian revolution will come in England. Will it come through the channel of the Communist Party or through the trade unions? Such a formulation of the question makes a show of a fictitiously broad historical outlook. It is radically false and dangerous because it obliterates the chief lesson of the last few years. If the triumphant revolution did not come at the end of the war, it was because a party was lacking. This conclusion applies to Europe as a whole. It may be traced concretely in the fate of the revolutionary movement in various countries. With respect to Germany, the case is quite a clear one. The German Revolution might have been triumphant both in 1918 and in 1919 had a proper party leadership been secured. We had an instance of this same thing in 1917 in the case of Finland. There, the revolutionary movement developed under exceptionally favorable circumstances under the wing of revolutionary Russia and with its direct military assistance. But the majority of the leaders in the Finnish party proved to be social democrats, and they ruined the revolution. The same lesson flows just as plainly from the Hungarian experience. There, the communists, along with the left social democrats, did not conquer power, but were handed it by the frightened bourgeoisie. The Hungarian revolution triumphant without a battle and without a victory was left from the very outset without a fighting leadership. The Communist Party fused with the Social Democratic Party showed thereby that it itself was not a communist party, and in consequence, in spite of the fighting spirit of the Hungarian workers, it proved incapable of keeping the power it had obtained so easily. Without a party, apart from a party, over the head of a party, or with a substitute for a party, the proletarian revolution cannot conquer. That is the principal lesson of the past decade. It is true that the English trade unions may become a mighty lever of the proletarian revolution. They may, for instance, even take the place of workers' Soviets under certain conditions and for a certain period of time. They can fill such a role, however, not apart from a communist party, and certainly not against the party but only on the condition that communist influence becomes the decisive influence in the trade unions. We have paid far too dearly for this conclusion with regard to the role and importance of a party in a proletarian revolution to renounce it so lightly, or even to minimize its significance. Consciousness, premeditation, and planning played a far smaller part in bourgeois revolutions than they are destined to play, and already do play, in proletarian revolutions. In the former instance, the motive force of the revolution was also furnished by the masses, but the latter were much less organized and much less conscious than at the present time. The leadership remained in the hands of different sections of the bourgeoisie, and the latter had at its disposal wealth, education, and all the organizational advantages connected with them, the cities, the universities, the press, etc. The bureaucratic monarchy defended itself in a hand-to-mouth manner probing in the dark, and then acting. The bourgeoisie would bide its time to seize a favorable moment when it could profit from the movement of the lower classes, throw its whole social weight into the scale, and so seize the state power. The proletarian revolution is precisely distinguished by the fact that the proletariat in the person of its vanguard acts in it not only as the main offensive force, but also as the guiding force. The part played in bourgeois revolutions by the economic power of the bourgeoisie, by its education, by its municipalities and universities, is a part which can be filled in a proletarian revolution only by the party of the proletariat. The role of the party has become all the more important in view of the fact that the enemy has also become far more conscious. The bourgeoisie, in the course of centuries of rule, has perfected a political schooling far superior to the schooling of the old bureaucratic monarchy. If parliamentarism served the proletariat to a certain extent as a training school for revolution, then it also served the bourgeoisie to a far greater extent as the school of counter-revolutionary strategy. Suffice it to say that by means of parliamentarism, the bourgeoisie was able so to train the social democracy that it is today the main prop of private property. The epoch of the social revolution in Europe, as has been shown by its very first steps, will be an epoch not only of strenuous and ruthless struggle, but also of planned and calculated battles far more planned than with us in 1917. That is why we require an approach entirely different from the prevailing one to the questions of civil war in general and of armed insurrection in particular. Following Lenin, 
all of us keep repeating time and again Marx's words that insurrection is an art. But this idea is transformed into a hollow phrase, to the extent that Marx's formula is not supplemented with a study of the fundamental elements of the art of civil war, on the basis of the vast accumulated experience of recent years, it is necessary to say candidly that a superficial attitude to questions of armed insurrection is a token that the power of the social democratic tradition has not yet been overcome. A party which pays superficial attention to the question of civil war, in the hope that everything will somehow settle itself at the crucial moment, is certain to be shipwrecked. We must analyze in a collective manner the experience of the proletarian struggles beginning with 1917. The above sketched history of the party groupings in 1917 also constitutes an integral part of the experience of civil war and is, we believe, of immediate importance to the policies of the communist international as a whole. We have already said, and we repeat, that the study of disagreements cannot, and ought not in any case, be regarded as an attack against those comrades who pursued a false policy. But on the other hand, it is absolutely impermissible to blot out the greatest chapter in the history of our party merely because some party members failed to keep step with the proletarian revolution. The party should and must know the whole of the past, so as to be able to estimate it correctly and assign each event to its proper place. The tradition of a revolutionary party is built not on evasions, but on critical clarity history secured for our party revolutionary advantages that are truly inestimable. The traditions of the heroic struggle against the Tsarist monarchy. The habituation to revolutionary self-sacrifice bound up with the conditions of underground activity. The broad theoretical study and assimilation of the revolutionary experience of humanity. The struggle against Menshevism, against the Narodniks, and against conciliationism. The supreme experience of the 1905 revolution. The theoretical study and assimilation of this experience during the years of counter-revolution. The examination of the problems of the international labor movement in the light of the revolutionary lessons of 1905. These were the things which in their totality gave our party an exceptional revolutionary temper, supreme theoretical penetration, and unparalleled revolutionary sweep. Nevertheless, even within this party, among its leaders, on the eve of decisive action, there was formed a group of experienced revolutionists, old Bolsheviks, who were in sharp opposition to the proletarian revolution, and who, in the course of the most critical period of the revolution from February 1917 to approximately February 1918, adopted on all fundamental questions an essentially social democratic position. It required Lenin, and Lenin's exceptional influence in the party, unprecedented even at that time, to safeguard the party and the revolution against the supreme confusion following from such a situation. This must never be forgotten if we wish other communist parties to learn anything from us. The question of selecting the leading staff is of exceptional importance to the parties of Western Europe. The experience of the abortive German October is shocking proof of this. But this selection must proceed in the light of revolutionary action. During these recent years, Germany has provided ample opportunities for the testing of the leading party members in moments of direct struggle. Failing this criterion, the rest is worthless. France, during these years, was much poorer in revolutionary upheavals, even partial ones. But even in the political life of France, we have had flashes of civil war, times when the Central Committee of the Party and the trade union leadership had to react in action to unpostponable and acute questions, such as the sanguinary meeting of January 11, 1924. A careful study of such acute episodes provides irreplaceable material for the evaluation of a party leadership the conduct of various party organs, and individual leading members. To ignore these lessons not to draw the necessary conclusions from them, as to the choice of personalities, is to invite inevitable defeats, for without a penetrating, resolute, and courageous party leadership, the victory of the proletarian revolution is impossible. Each party, even the most revolutionary party, must inevitably produce its own organizational conservatism for otherwise it would lack the necessary stability. This is wholly a question of degree. In a revolutionary party, the vitally necessary dose of conservatism must be combined with a complete freedom from routine, with initiative and orientation and daring in action. 
These qualities are put to the severest test during turning points in history. We have already quoted the words of Lenin to the effect that even the most revolutionary parties, when an abrupt change occurs in a situation, and when new tasks arise as a consequence, frequently pursue the political line of yesterday, and thereby become, or threaten to become, a break upon the revolutionary process. Both conservatism and revolutionary initiative find their most concentrated expression in the leading organs of the party. In the meantime, the European Communist parties have still to face their sharpest turning point, the turn from preparatory work to the actual seizure of power. This turn is the most exacting, the most unpostponable, the most responsible, and the most formidable. To miss the moment for the turn is to incur the greatest defeat that a party can possibly suffer. The experience of the European struggles, and above all the struggles in Germany, when looked at in the light of our own experience, tells us that there are two types of leaders who incline to drag the party back at the very moment when it must take a stupendous leap forward. Some among them generally tend to see mainly the difficulties and obstacles in the way of revolution, and to estimate each situation with a preconceived, though not always conscious, intention of avoiding any action. Marxism in their hands is turned into a method for establishing the impossibility of revolutionary action. The purest specimens of this type are the Russian Mensheviks. But this type as such is not confined to Menshevism and at the most critical moment, it suddenly manifests itself in responsible posts in the most revolutionary party. The representatives of the second variety are distinguished by their superficial and agitational approach. They never see any obstacles or difficulties until they come into a head-on collision with them. The capacity for surmounting real obstacles by means of bombastic phrases, the tendency to evince lofty optimism on all questions, the ocean is only knee-deep, is inevitably transformed into its polar opposite when the hour for decisive action strikes. To the first type of revolutionist, who makes mountains out of molehills, the problems of seizing power lie in heaping up and multiplying to the NTH degree all the difficulties he has become accustomed to see in his way. To the second type, the superficial optimist, the difficulties of revolutionary action always come as a surprise. In the preparatory period the behavior of the two is different. The former is a skeptic upon whom one cannot rely too much, that is, in a revolutionary sense. The latter, on the contrary, may seem a fanatic revolutionist, but at the decisive moment the two march hand in hand. They both oppose the insurrection. Meanwhile, the entire preparatory work is of value only to the extent that it renders the party and above all its leading organs capable of determining the moment for an insurrection and of assuming the leadership of it. For the task of the Communist Party is the conquest of power for the purpose of reconstructing society. Much has been spoken and written lately on the necessity of Bolshevizing the Comintern. This is a task that cannot be disputed or delayed. It is made particularly urgent after the cruel lessons of Bulgaria and Germany a year ago. Bolshevism is not a doctrine i.e. not merely a doctrine, but a system of revolutionary training for the proletarian uprising. What is the Bolshevization of communist parties? It is giving them such a training and affecting such a selection of the leading staff as would prevent them from drifting when the hour for their October strikes. That is the whole of Hegel and the wisdom of books and the meaning of all philosophy.